Rin from Hallowed Be Thy Game, and today I'm going to share 10 weird and obscure JRPGs. Let's check it out. Welcome back to another episode of Hallowed Be Thy Game, Ren here, and I got a bit of a different video for you here today. Uh, I'm going to be covering 10 weird and obscure JRPGs that I have personally in my collection. So I want to share these. Um, I'll, I get a ton of questions about any of these games anytime I ever show them on the channel. And there's a couple on here that I've never shown before. If you're a newcomer to the channel, I love the obscure and hidden gems of games. A lot of you probably have discovered the channel through one of my hidden gems videos. I just have a passion for games that attempt something way out there, completely different, or just slip through the cracks. Uh, I just can't get enough of them. Now look, these are just the 10 weird and obscure games that I own. I would love to know what your weirdest and most obscure JRPG is that you own because I can't get enough of this and I always find out more games I've never heard of from the community. So please help me out. I would love to check it out. And hey, if I've never played it before and I think it's weird and obscure enough, you might see it on the channel. But without further ado, let's go ahead and shine a light on the weird and obscure. Now, the first game on today's list is The Wizard of Oz Beyond the Yellow Brick Road for the Nintendo DS. This is quite possibly maybe the weirdest and rarest game in my collection. Now, one thing I've found, no matter how long I've been gaming, the Nintendo DS will have some of the weirdest and most obscure games, and I swear I am always discovering a game I've never heard of before. Now, The Wizard of Oz, quite possibly the most unique JRPG ever made. I know that's a bold claim, but hear me out. Now, in order to move in this game, you have like a crystal ball orb on the bottom screen and like a track ball, you will roll it in order to move and you can spin it really fast to move fast or slow. Now, this game has an intoxicating PS1 anime JRPG look to it. This is the very definition of cozy, but also it just takes the IP of Wizard of Oz in just a really cool, bold, unique direction. You know, just here recently, there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of drama about the Alice in Wonderland with EA and his really sad information. We're not going to get into here, but I really think that The Wizard of Oz has a wealth of potential for video games to maybe go in some unique anime or JRPG directions and possibly just to even maybe have even spookier type games that maybe stay closer to the original source material. Anyways, that's a discussion for another day, but this is just an ultimate unique weird game that I think anyone who's a fan of <laughs> that, whatever that is, you really got to check this one out. It is, it comes highly recommended for me. It doesn't have like extremely deep mechanics or anything like that in it. It's a pretty standard turn-based game, but just the presentation and just the idea of thinking outside of the box for Wizard of Oz is just excellent and I can't get enough of it. Now, next up, I'm going to be sharing a Nintendo 3DS game with you. And I've talked about this one before, but Lord of Magna Made in Heaven. This game is gloriously just a, a wonderful SRPG that really just takes the basic concepts of being able to move in like almost like an SRPG format, but it adds in physics-based mechanics to the combat itself. So essentially, you'll have your standard layout when you would think of an SRPG, but instead you'll have these targeted reticle moves from your maidens and or your army. And essentially your goal is to be able to build up like a bowling type blast mechanic to where you'll hit an enemy and hopefully trigger more domino effects of them hitting subsequent people behind them. But there's just a fun amount of strategy here. Nothing too insane. This was not an extremely difficult game to beat or anything, but it has just wonderfully animated uh, sprites and character panels that I just genuinely just found to be extremely well done and I wish more games would dip into. I, I do see it more frequently where you'll, you'll have like a static character panel but they'll put in some animations for talking. But this one just seemed to animate it so much better and it pops really well on the 3DS. But also on top of that, you have like a very much a harem based game with, loaded with anime tropes 
It's a guilty pleasure, but it's also really freaking fun, weird, and awesome. And I can't recommend it enough. This is easily, I think, one of the best hidden gems on the 3DS. And I can, I just can recommend this to anybody who's just not immediately turned off by like anime tropes. But it's freaking fun. It's awesome. Why wouldn't you play it? It's, it's a good time. Lord of Magnet comes highly recommended from me. Now heading back to the DS, cause look, I'm telling you guys, the DS is just a gold mine of just weird. But Nights in the Nightmare. Now I did recently cover this in my most recent pickups and I haven't been able to play it as much as I've wanted to. Just making the bigger list videos and all that, but I am beyond excited and a, just a little bit intimidated to get into this one cause I hear it is very difficult, but also that the combat is extremely unique. So again, you do have an SRPG format, but instead of like bowling and different weird types of mechanics like that, this one blends elements of like a shmup with SRPGs, and that is so weird. But honestly, uh, I'll, I'll try to get a good enough footage to be able to show you guys what the combat looks like. But essentially, you'll use your cursor to initiate combat and moves on the battlefield. But there'll be different things moving around almost like a shmup and you'll want to dodge it to be able to unleash your uh, move and blast through enemies. This is absolutely just gorgeous pixel art. Now Atlas did publish this. I haven't heard a ton about the developer Sting. I really should have done some more research on what they've done before doing this, but oh, here we are. But anyways, this is just gloriously weird and obscure. And the fact that I've made it all the way to 2023 and only just this year heard about this. And this is a beloved, like, I know one thing about Nights in the Nightmare. If you've played it, you loved it, even though it was really hard. And I'm excited to be able to experience it um, on the original DS. I'm gonna be busting out my DS, getting it charged And But again, Nights in the Nightmare, weird and obscure, who knew? Now, next up, we have Magna Carta Tears of Blood for the PS2. There's a whole lot going on about this game that is just extremely unique. I would say this definitely has like a love or hate it type vibe about it for most people who've played it. I do enjoy this game. And it's mostly because of just how many risks this game took to just do something different. Uh, and the main thing being that when you are going to attack in this game, there is like a timed button entry system. Um, I would go, this could be heresy, but if you really love like um, Shadow Hearts with that um, judgment ring, it's going to be similar to that. However, in this, you're going to have just some of the most gorgeous, unique character designs I've ever seen. This is absolutely loaded with fan service. So for everybody out there who hates my guts for the fan service I put in these videos, be warned. It is a game that has in time shown its age, but I think this is just kind of like a wonderful end cap to like the PS2 era of JRPGs. Cause this did come out right before the PS3 did. And um, I'm sad to say that I think this, this series is done. I don't think it's ever gonna leave the PS2, but this is something that I think could do well. I mean, if we're seeing like record of Agoras war come back and, and stuff like that, then I think we definitely should at least see Magna Carta one and two get ports because the second one is a, an Xbox 360 exclusive. Like what the heck? Like it would be awesome to have like a duology double pack of this come back in some method, but it's a, it's a unique and weird game and that's why it's on this list. And I think it's fun. I think it is something, you know, if you're looking for uh, something that you're not gonna play anything else like, I, I think this is definitely close to that mark. Now we're gonna be coming back to the 3DS cause I love the 3DS and I wanted to shout this game out again. Moko Moko Friends. This is definitely like a Pokemon-esque type game. You're gonna be raising plush skins and raiding dungeons and all that goodness. Uh, it is cuteness overload. I've said that before, I say it again. Um, but for me, this is definitely more on the weird side because this isn't necessarily doing anything completely different that you're not gonna see in other types of games in this like collect-a-thon type genre. But if you are looking for more collect-a-thons and you've kind of run out, definitely give this one a shot. Now, I know it's on the 3DS and I know everybody out there wants to tell me that you can hack the 3DS and all that. Shockingly, I am aware of those methods. But anyways, whether you get this game physically, which it is skyrocketing in price, or if you picked it up, I, I definitely think this is 
one that I hope more people tried out before the 3DS eShop closed. Uh, we tried to shout it out on the channel, but I still think this one's heavily fallen through the cracks, and I think this is just going to be a permanently obscure, weird game. So, which is sad because uh, it definitely has like just a really cute, unique. 3ds graphics art style to it but it's one that i think everybody should at least give a shot if you're into collectathons now i got two games coming up for you here and they are the best vampire games ever created and i won't hear otherwise actually that's not the case but akiba's trip hellbound and debriefed and also undead and undressed i mean come on these games are the epitome of juvenile stupid delinquent humor and I won't hear otherwise. They're awesome. I, I, the gameplay in the first one is pretty atrocious. I would go as far to say it's one of the worst playing games I've played in recent memory. However, they're hilarious. And I think the second one is much better implemented. So essentially, um, there's there's vampires in Akiba. No way. And uh, the only way to kill them is to expose them to sunlight, which involves possibly you know, de-pantsing them, ripping their shirts off. Um, definitely some gray areas here. This one definitely caused a lot of hubbub and concern when it came out. No way. But um, anyways, I, they're, they're gloriously stupid, and I love it. Uh, there's so much just over-the-top humor in these. Despite how horrible the first one is to play, it has some of the funniest dialogue and storytelling uh, of any game ever, which totally makes it worth playing just for that alone. But if you're somebody who's really sensitive to the gameplay, definitely check out the second one. You know you don't need to play the first. <laughs> Even if the stories were connected, I mean, they're not that. <laughs> they're not that deep. But they're just a lot of fun and epically weird. I can't recommend them enough. Now, I gotta shout it out. From the rooftops, the Nintendo DS holds one of the best, most oddest games ever, and I freaking love it. Super Robot Tyson, OG Saga, Endless Frontier, Easily the game I get the most questions about in any video I ever put it in. Uh, I don't think I'm going to be using any of the characters for the thumbnails on this, which is a shame. But uh, yes, this right here is the tippy top of the most obscure game from the DS, which is a crying shame because this game freaking slaps. This is without a doubt one of my favorite combat systems on the DS. Uh, it's almost like a fighter meets turn-based JRPG, it's so weird, with some of the best sprite work in, like, all the DS to me. Like, I think that's why this game is so, like, fascinating to people. And if I could only pick one game from all of today's list, modern-day port to consoles, it would be Super Robot Tyson, OG Saga, Endless Frontier. Yes, I have to say it every time. But really, you're going to be having just a mesh of different types of IPs into this. You have... Cosmos from Xenosaga and you just got a whole lot going on with just an epic weird story but it's one that is ultra addictive to play. I got Danik to play this one a little bit ago and he had a blast with it. I mean it's just a game that completely flew under the radar. It's a nightmare to get physically now. One of the prizes of my collection. I love it and I can't recommend it enough no matter how you're able to play it. Now we just talked about it in my most recent Hidden Gems video. Definitely check that out. Uh, but Hero Must Die Again. This is ultra unique. Um, so the premise is at the very beginning of the game you slay the big bad evil. But during the process the hero is killed. Now, the gods take pity on him and grant him an extra five days to put his affairs in order and try to put the affairs of the kingdom in order to be able to have the kingdom have the best shot at a future. So essentially, you are living out the final five days of his life and you start out at god tier power levels. But as the days slowly progress and if you don't manage your character's health and fatigue correctly, he will quickly and steeply decline in power levels. You want to assemble your team together to just make sure the kingdom can continue on in your absence. Uh, a surprisingly heartfelt and emotionally touching story, um, just about the acceptance of death and the impact we leave behind. Um, this game is obviously not going to be for everybody because um, when I say time limit, that immediately turns people off. But I would venture to just implore you that if that doesn't immediately just turn you off where you won't have anything to do with it, give it a shot. It's a game that definitely rewards uh, planning and just routing. It's excellent. And 
uh, not hardly, hardly anybody talks about this game, which I get it. The time limit's definitely not extremely marketable to people. And um, that would definitely be the most negative aspect of it, even though I do think it's handled really well. But Hero Must Die Again, I think it is going to be going down as just a game for me that did something no one else would ever attempt or try and create like a rogue light experience where you're just planning that run of those five days. I think an entire run, quote unquote, of this game can take a little over two hours. Gosh, I don't know. Every time I've played this game, I've just kind of binged it and lost track of time. Hero Must Die Again. I think if you are in the mood for ultra unique and obscure, this is an absolute must stop destination for you. Now, last up on today's list is easily the rarest game in all of my collection. And as Arno Surge Plus, Ode to an Unborn Star. This is the only game I've personally ever played from the Arno Surge series. I highly hope that at some point this and CL No Surge are ported to the Switch and PS4. Like, please localize those to the West. They're already in Japan. But anyways, this game has so many unique aspects about it. However, one of the weirdest things about it is that you can essentially enter a dungeon and do an encounter correctly to where you completely obliterate every random encounter in the entire room and dungeon that you're in. And something that, it's just weird, but extremely satisfying when you just obliterate wave after wave of enemy. Um, this is one I've been meaning to come back to. I covered this very early on in the channel, and I've been wanting to come back to it and play it again, because. I don't know, it's got gorgeous music and it's just weird like to be able to grow closer to your party members. It's loaded with fan service. Shocked, I know you are. But anyways, it's one that I think has a lot of passionate fans about it for a good reason. Because I think this one deserves to kind of experience the light of day again. But I do fear that for the West, this is going to be permanently obscure on the PS Vita. And, and that's sad because, you know, as, as fun as it is to be able to say you own a rare game, it's more fun to be able to share that love with a, a group of people who are playing it as well. And I think this game needs to come to the West. I think they should try it again. Uh, the PS Vita was ultra niche at the time as much as I love it. And I think it would flourish on the Nintendo Switch in the West now. But despite being an ultra weird and obscure game, it's one that I have a lot of fun with. And I think everybody would too. So if you have the opportunity to play this, I highly recommend it. And with that, those are 10 weird and obscure JRPGs from my personal collection. I have so much fun just kind of digging these games out. There's a couple of others I wanted to throw on here, but we'll just kind of test the waters and see if you all like this. And you can let me know if you liked it by liking the video and letting me know what your weirdest and most obscure game is in your collection down in the comments. Like this video if you like it and subscribe for more JRPG content. I want to thank the channel members and patrons for making these types of videos possible. I wish you all the best, and I'll see you next time.